All right, I'd like to bring up Gary Watt to introduce our speaker. All right, good morning, everybody. It's great to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for supporting the Bar Association. Uh, it is really wonderful to see you all here. And for those of you online, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're living in a time when it seems as if uh, facts, science, uh, and apparently ethics, and particularly judicial ethics, are unimportant. But our guest speaker today has some things to say about that. Justice Peter Sagan spent about 15 years on the Court of Appeal, much of that as the presiding justice of Division Three. And as I look around the room here and I see all these empty tables up front, I'm wondering if all of you think he's gonna be still in his justice mode and asking you questions, interrupting your breakfast and firing away. But I think today the tables might be turned a little bit and if there's time you get to fire some questions at him. So make the most of it, right? Um, so without any further ado, here is Justice Siggins, and welcome. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here today. Um, I will say that I, I had been to the Marriott and Walnut Creek a couple of times. I know some of you prefer that as a venue but I prefer the parking here, so it's much, much better. Um, I, I, also, uh, I also used to sit in the back of the room, so I get it. I, I think I sat in the back of the room for every class I ever had, so. Um, look, I, I think today we're just gonna try to talk a little bit about what's going on with our U.S. Supreme Court. Um, we've seen a lot of stories about the ethical challenges that some people say the judge, justices have, or some concerns that people have about things that the justices are doing. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit uh, since we're getting just a late start, and we're just gonna review those. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of those ethical issues right off the bat. Um, first of all, uh, it's not been widely reported, but but one of the things that has come up is that uh, justices have been attending certain dinners, certain events where they're featured and they're used as a target for fundraising. And this is um, colleges and universities have used Justice Thomas, Justice Breyer, Sotomayor and Kagan have all appeared at, at events like that. Justice Thomas also appeared at a featured, uh, as a featured guest at a Coke Network Donor Summit, which is a conservative uh, lobbying group raising money for them. The big one that I think we've all seen are the sponsored uh, travel and accommodations. This actually goes back a long way. Justice Scalia, it was first raised uh, with, with him in 2002 when he went on a hunting trip with Vice President Cheney and traveled on Air Force Two to get there. Uh, it was disclosed by him. He was uh, alleged to have uh, should be, or it was alleged that he should have recused from a case involving Justice Cheney. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in 2008, Justice Alito was on a fishing trip with a, with a hedge fund donor, uh, a hedge fund billionaire, who later in 2014 had a case before the court. And then Justice Thomas, who uh, has received continuing hospitality from Harlan Crow, who is a... Um, a conservative advocate and billionaire trips to the Adirondacks in 2022, previous trips to Indonesia. Uh, Politico says that Justice Thomas has had as many as 38 vacations, 26 private plane flights, and 12 VI passes to high profile sporting events over the years. Um, certain real estate transactions have always also been reported. Uh, Harlan Crow purchased the home and vacant lots uh, that were owned by Justice Thomas's mother in Savannah, Georgia. He paid $133,000 for them. Um, and then also Gus Justice Gorsuch uh, recently sold a property in Colorado that wasn't uh, properly reported. The buyer of the property was the chairman of Greenberg Traurig. Um, and Gus when Justice Gorsuch reported the transaction, he reported the income from the LLC that owned the property, of which he was a member. 
So the true purchaser of the property was not reported. That has appeared in the news. Uh, the most recent development on loans is it returned, uh, discusses Justice Thomas's personal loan for $267,000. Um, he, uh, from Anthony Welters, who was a longtime friend of his, uh, originally, Mr. Welters just said that this loan was satisfied. The loan was outstanding from 1999 to 2008. And last week, a Senate report disclosed that the loan was excused by Mr. Welters. Um, it, it's not clear that, or it doesn't appear that Mr. Welters has ever had business before the court, but the loan and the circumstances surrounding it have raised eyebrows. Um, there's also been some discussion about spousal income. Uh, spousal income is required to be reported by the justices under federal statutes. And there has been some concern about the Chief Justice's wife, Jane Sullivan Roberts, who received millions of dollars in placement fees for placing lawyers whose firms regularly had business before the court. It, it is, uh, there's nothing that indicates that she placed the lawyer who had business before the court or that she worked for a firm while a case was pending before the court. And then also Justice Thomas's wife, Virginia, receives consulting fees from a nonprofit, uh, nonprofit organizations that were not clearly disclosed on his disclosure. Um, the next thing I want to talk about that people don't think about as ethical issues, but they're huge ethical issues, and that is leaks. And we know about the big one. Right, we, we know about um, um, the abortion case last year, Dobbs versus Jack, Women's Jackson's Health, but also in 2014, Justice Alito was at a private dinner and he uh, indicated to the guests at that dinner what the outcome of a case was going to be. And that case was Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, which is the case that held, ultimately written by Justice Alito, that held that the, um, that the and a, a religious objection to paying for uh, prenatal health services uh, is valid under the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and that the, the um, mandate in the Affordable Care Act need not be followed. And um, that was fairly widely reported at the time. There have also been issues with respect to gifts for family members, and this one Again, is Mr. Crow and Justice Thomas. Um, his, uh, Justice Thomas has a grandnephew who lives with him. He attends a private school. Justice Crow has, or <laughs> Justice, sorry about that. That's a slip. <laughs> Mr. Crow has been paying 6000 a month in tuition for that, uh, that young man. Um, finally, I, uh, just a few more, but political activity uh, is something that is, has come up with respect to Justice Thomas's wife, Virginia. She is one of nine members of the board of the uh, Council for National Policy, urging Republican lawmakers to challenge the 2020 election. And then finally, uh, with respect to political activity, uh, some of you may remember Justice Alito in the audience at, at President Obama's 2010 State of the Union speech um, when he um, was talking about Citizens United and Justice, uh, President Obama was critical of the decision, Justice Alito mouthed, not true. And I think that's a political statement. I would characterize that as a political statement. I don't think it was something that I, as a judge, would do sitting there listening to a governor's state of the state speech. Um, then there are book deals. Um, Justice Jackson has a $3 million advance that has been reported. Justice Gorsuch has an advance of $650,000. Justice Comey, Comey Barrett has an advance of $2 million. Justice Sotomayor reports $3.7 million in income from her book. The issue with respect to this is the use of court resources to arrange for book signings and, and send out books. and and make sure that books are in supply at the various booksellers. And Justice Sotomayor has been criticized for possibly using her staff to do that. And finally, uh, with respect to media interviews, an issue arose just this year. Uh, Justice Alito gave a, an interview to
to David Rifkin, who's a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. And Rifkin at the time was a lawyer representing a party in a case called Moore versus United States. And Moore was set to be argued before the court at the time that Alito gave the interview. Um, he received a letter from Senator Durbin, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, criticizing him uh, with respect to um, with respect to participating in that interview, and we'll address that in a little bit. Uh, what I want to do is go through, I've gone through some of these, they're up there. Now I want to talk a little bit about what the federal rules are, how they came to be, um, and then uh, we'll kind of look at these under the lens of the federal rules and we'll decide, or hopefully think about, whether there are violations and, and in fact, what should be done about them. Um, but, you know, the, California has a very robust system for judicial discipline and judicial ethics. When judges are appointed, you get a handbook of judicial ethics. It's about three and a half inches thick. Uh, there's the Commission on Judicial Performance. There are the canons and the codes. There are um, uh, advisory opinions available from both the California Judges Association and the California Judicial Council. And the federal system is a little bit different. It's, um, it, it's, uh, I just skipped the slide, but that's okay. The, the federal system is a little bit leaner, um, and historically, the, the, the chief measure of discipline against federal judges has been impeachment. Over our, our history, there have been 15 federal judges that have been impeached. Eight of them were removed before trial. Three resigned, and four acquitted. One Supreme Court justice has been impeached, and that was Justice Chase in 1804. He was impeached at a time when um, judge, the Supreme Court judges presided over trials. And the claim of impeachment against him, the charge of impeachment against him, was that he impaneled unfair juries, and he didn't allow defense witnesses to testify. Um, he ended up uh, getting acquitted in the Senate. And impeachment is typically serious misconduct, soliciting bribes, perjury, the practice of law by a sitting judge, income tax evasion. Those are the kinds of things that historically have led to serious discipline against federal judges. There is a dis discipline statute, and the discipline statute works. Um, the, the, the discipline statute works by by, uh, it's a complaint motivated statute. The, uh, a party who has a complaint about a federal judge sends a letter to the chief judge of the circuit in which that federal judge sits. That the chief judge of the circuit then can determine whether it states a claim, doesn't state a claim. If he, does, if, if he or she determines it states a claim, they then refer it to the judge for response and then uh, after the judge responds, they then refer it to another panel of judges for consideration of possible discipline. Um, but the federal, the federal system is considerably streamlined. Judges shall hold their office in times of good behavior under Article 3, a lifetime appointment. And so the, 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 statutory, the statutory remedy cannot be the most severe remedy. That remedy is left up to Congress. Um, so I want to talk about the origins of the federal, the federal Code of Conduct. The Federal Code of Conduct are the canons that apply to federal judges. And they began because of this guy. This is Kennesaw Mountain Landis. He was a federal judge in the Northern District of Illinois. He was appointed by Teddy Roosevelt in 1905, and he served in 1922. In 1920, he, the Major League Baseball owners came to him following the 1919 Black Sox scandal when the Chicago White Sox threw the World Series. And the Major League Baseball owners said, hey, we need a commissioner. We need somebody to restore integrity to the game. Will you do it? And Landis said, sure, I'll do it. I'd love to be the commissioner of baseball. He became the first commissioner of baseball, and he thought he could do both, judge, both jobs at the same time. If you'll see, 1905 to 1922, he was a federal judge. And he was the commissioner from 1920 to 1944. He ended up 
resigning his judgeship, and he was one of those who resigned when charges were pending against him in an impeachment proceeding. So that led to the first judicial canons that were developed in 1924. The ABA appointed a, a committee chaired by Chief Justice Taft. Uh, they produced 39 different um, canons for judges to follow. They weren't particularly um, intended for discipline. They were really intended to be a reminder to the judiciary. They say things like, Justice should not be molded by the individual idiosyncrasies of those who administer it. Good luck enforcing that. Uh, and courts exist to promote justice and thus serve the public. Their administration should be speedy and careful. So they really weren't something that were designed to impose a disciplinary system on judges, but nevertheless, a lot of states adopted them as canons of, for judicial behavior. And things went along fairly quietly until we came to these guys. If any, does anyone recognize them? Wow, okay. Oh, Mark, thank you. <laughs> another, another nerd like me, I appreciate it. Um, the guy on the left, the justice on the left, is Abe Fortas. He served on the court from 65 to 69. He was appointed by Johnson. He, um, uh, he was the lawyer who argued Gideon. He was appointed by the court to argue Gideon. His firm was Arnold Fortas and Porter, now Arnold and Porter. Um, and uh, Abe Fortas was, uh, at the time when the Supreme Court was making, the justices' salaries were $39,500. Abe Fortas was on a $20,000 retainer from the Wolfson Foundation, Family Foundation. Lewis Wolfson was a uh, industrialist who was into shipbuilding and heavy construction. His firm actually built the USS Kitty Hawk uh, uh, aircraft carrier. And, as, and the Washington Post got wind of the fact that Justice Fortas was being paid 20,000 bucks a year by a private foundation and they were going to publicize it. And when they went to do that, Judge Fortas, who had also been nominated as Chief Justice by Just President Johnson, he resigned from the court. And the other justice that had trouble at the same time is Justice Douglas, William O. Douglas, who was the um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt appointee, long tenure on the court. But it surfaced at the same time that Justice Douglas was getting $12,000 a year from the Parvin Foundation. The Alvin Par Albert Parvin was a casino operator and he had a furniture manufacturing firm. Douglas was getting paid to be the president of the foundation. The difference between these two is that Douglas had responsibilities. As the president of the foundation, he would, he would grant and approve fellowships for, for people going overseas to study, uh, to study uh, government structures. Uh, essentially, it was it was a fellowship for academics and, and for people pursuing their PhDs. And whereas Fortas had to resign, Douglas survived. Although Gerald Ford, as a congressman, introduced um, or announced that he was going to investigate Douglas's fitness for office, and then a congressman, a smart congressman from Indiana, Democrat Andrew Jacobs, referred. Justice's case to the Judiciary Committee and kind of sidelined Gerald Ford's investigation. A year later, the Judiciary Committee says, oh no, no foul. It's just, he, he resigned as well, so it's okay. He resigned from the foundation. Um, so in response to this, the ABA uh, convened, convened a special committee on judicial standards. They issue a code of conduct in 1972, and that committee was chaired by Roger Trainer from California, California's Chief Justice. And they come up with seven canons for judges to follow. The Judicial Conference of the United States, at the same time, form a special committee in April of 1972. They adopt the canons from the ABA in April of 1973, and they say they apply to all federal judges, full-time referees in bankruptcy, and full-time magistrates not justices. They don't identify justices. They don't identify the Supreme Court. Um, it, it, it has long been the position of 
uh, the Chief Justice that the Judicial Conference of the U.S. has no authority over the Supreme Court. He sits at the, at the top of the Judicial Conference of the United States. Uh, and I think later on we'll see it's more custom than uh, and history <coughs> than anything that is uh, said in law. Okay. So there are five current canons, and they are informed by um, five current canons that are informed by uh, codified language that is that is very specific. The canons themselves are general, but they they guide specific behavior. Uh, number one, a judge should uphold the integrity and independence of the judiciary. The the language beneath the canon explains. Look, these are going to be rules of reason. Interpret them in light of all the other legal obligations judges have. They should be they should rule without fear or favor. We don't want to intrude upon uh, judicial independence and violation of these of these canons diminishes public confidence in the judiciary. That those are that is black letter under the first canon. The second one. A judge should avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety in all activities. Uh, and, and the canon goes on to state that an appearance of impropriety occurs when reasonable minds with knowledge of relevant circumstances disclosed by reasonable inquiry would conclude the judge's honesty, integrity, impartiality, temperament, or fitness to serve as a judge is impaired. Right? So reasonableness, aware of all the facts, and you, you can reach a conclusion. <clears throat> the third, judges should not allow, uh, I, I'm sorry, judges should perform the duties of the office fairly, impartially, and diligently. And then this breaks down into both adjudicative activities and administrative activities. <clears throat> Among the adjudicative, adjudicative activities, they talk about competence, all that kind of stuff. There is a mandate, just like California's had, judges have, to assign matters that are assigned to you, to decide those cases that, to which you are assigned. So no easy out. In other words, when decisions are made to recuse, <coughs> you balance the reasons for recusal against the need to serve. And we'll see that the Supreme Court does that in the few cases that they describe for us. Um, you know, afford the parties a full right to be heard. Dispose of cases promptly. Uh, promptly. And then Canon 3 also includes the, the admonition that judges should not comment on pending cases. Um, it, it, finally, the third thing after the administrative responsibilities, Canon 3 talks about disqualification, and it says disqual judges should disqualify when their impartiality may be reasonably questioned. And uh, then it gives examples, knowledge of the facts, personal bias, were they a lawyer or a witness for a party, uh, or is the judge or one within a third degree of a relationship to the judge. So someone in their home, someone in their family, um, a, lawyer, a, a, a lawyer, material witness, or has an interest that would be substantially affected by the outcome. Um, and then finally, uh, it, it does talk about financial conflicts, and essentially, when judges have financial conflicts, divestment is a cure. So, if a judge has a, a federal judge has a financial conflict, they can divest, be cured of the conflict, and continue to hear the matter. That is not what California judges can do. Um, okay. Canon 4 allows judges to engage in extrajudicial activities consistent with the obligations of their office, uh, things like uh, teaching, lecturing, uh, testifying before legislative committees, civic and charitable religious organizations, uh, provided they don't, they don't raise funds for, for groups that are not affiliated with the law. Um, Canon 5 is to retain, restrain from political activity. You can't be on the central committee. You can't be uh, running for an office as a judge. If you do, you forfeit the, off the judicial office. Um, and then there are also some 
statutes, federal ethics statutes that apply to the judiciary. The first is the Ethics in Government Act, and it's essentially a reporting statute. The, the uh, Ethics Reform Act contains the federal gift prohibition. And the Ethics in Government Act uh, requires reports, annual reports of outside income. It has a civil penalty, potentially prison, for via willful or false uh, reports. And then it has outside income and employment limits. By its terms, it applies to the term judicial officer means the Chief Justice of the United States, Associate Justices of the Supreme Court, and the judges of the U.S. Courts of Appeals and the U.S. District Courts. The gift prohibition, similarly, covers federal offices and employees. And it says the term officer or employee means an individual holding an appointed ele or elective position in the executive, legislative, or judicial branch of government. That's everyone. So as we proceed, you're going to see that there is a difference of opinion on the Supreme Court whether Congress has the authority to enact laws that include members of the Supreme Court. Congress apparently thinks they have that authority. And um, so the, the, the gift regulation, the gift uh, prohibition is implemented by regulations that are adopted by the U.S. Judicial Conference. And essentially, judges are not, federal judges are not allowed to take gifts from anyone doing business before the court or substantially affected by the performance of their duties. There is also a recusal statute uh, that, that applies and states that any justice, judge, or magistrate shall disqualify in any proceeding in which impartiality might reasonably be questioned. And then it contains a bunch of specific circumstances. Um, other, uh, and it says those circumstances that are not enumerated here are waivable by the parties. There is a, a, a foreign gift prohibition where you can't get gifts from a foreign government except of nominal value. Uh, there is a limit on honorary club memberships that can be given to judges to $50 per year. And uh, there is also uh, a very recent uh, amendment or a very recent statute that governs uh, initial private offering or initial public offerings and stock sales and also the transition to the private sector after being a judge. Uh, we don't really need to talk about that very much. So, um, so just to give some context, annual salary for a Supreme Court justice is $285,400. There's a limit on outside earned income of $30,000. There's no limit, of course, on investment income or, invest or income from books. Um, why are we repeating? Okay, here we go. Uh, so, in tw 2011, uh, Justice Roberts, in his report to the, uh, on the federal judiciary, uh, sorry, lost my place here. Oh, here we go. Okay. He says, the code of conduct by its express terms applies only to lower federal judges. Okay, remember, this is 2011. This is really before any of these things, uh, any of the, the current stories really came up. That reflects a fundamental difference between the Supreme Court and the other federal courts. Article 3 of the Constitution creates only one court. Sorry about this. The Supreme Court of the United States, but it empowers Congress to establish additional lower federal courts. Uh, Congress instituted the Judicial Conference for the benefit of the courts it had created. Because the Judicial Conference is an instrument for the management of the lower federal courts, its committees have no mandate to prescribe rules or standards for any other body. Um, similarly, Justice Alito, and maybe even more emphatically, he says, look, the court's constitutional, and the Constitution makes no, pro no provision for Congress to regulate the court. He's not alone in saying that. Justice uh, Breyer and uh, Scalia have both expressed similar sentiments. Justice Kagan, on the other hand, 
She says, of course Congress can regulate aspects of what the Supreme Court does. And then she ticks off a bunch of them. And she says, Congress sets the court's budget, it can increase or shrink the size of the court, and it has over the years done both. It can make changes to the court's jurisdiction, and indeed the Constitution provides that the court has appellate jurisdiction, quote, with such exceptions and under such regulations as Congress shall make, and she quotes Article 3, Section 2. And then just last week, Justice Barrett said, hey, there ought to be a code of conduct, and we ought to, we ought to come up with something, uh, meaning, though, that they ought to come up with something as a court. So what do they do to follow the rule? Justice, in his 2011 report, Justice Roberts says, all members of the court do, in fact, help the co consult the code of conduct in assessing their ethical obligations. In this way, the code plays the same role as for the justices as it does for the other federal judges. And then, most recently, Senator Durbin had sent a letter to Justice Roberts asking him to come to the uh, Judiciary Committee and testify about the Supreme Court and its ethical uh, obligations and the ethical guidelines. And it, in response to that, Justice Roberts uh, sends, Durbin a, sends Durbin a letter where he declines to come. Uh, he appends to that letter a statement on ethics, principles, and practices, which is signed by all the justices of the court. And he says, hey, we consult a wide range of authority. And in 1991, members of this court voluntarily adopted a resolution to follow the substance of the Judicial Council regulations. I tried to find that 1991 resolution. I tried to see where it was, why it came about. I'm mystified. I, I just couldn't find it in anything. But the statement, what? For some reason, we're repeating slides here. So, okay, statement of of on ethics, principles, and practices. He he says there the judges consult a wide range of uh, authority to address their specific ethical issues. The code of conduct, he says, is of significant importance to the justices. He doesn't say we'll follow it. He doesn't say it's the law. He says it's, it's significantly important. Um, and the canons, he says, inform ethical conduct, but they are not rules themselves. Well, that's correct as far as it goes. They're broadly stated principles. We saw the five of them. But behind, behind the canons and under the canons are specific guidelines that federal judges must follow. Um, and then he says, the, the recusals follow the same standard and statutes as for other federal judges, except we have a consideration to have a full court when we can have a full court. And that weighs against recusal in specific circumstances. That a court that is minus one justice is an eight-member court. And if, a, if an eight-member court splits four to four, the uh, the circuit decision or the lower court decision is affirmed. So there is a special consideration. And then he says, look, in recent years, at the cert stage, when the court considers petition for certiorari, we have a couple of hundred recusals. And, quote, a few at the merit stage as well. The thing about the merit stage is that you rarely know why a justice recuses. And we'll get to that in a second. And he says they're often for obvious really reasons, and sometimes publicly revealing the basis for recusal would be unwise. And, and it's unwise for a couple of reasons. One, he says lawyers will try to game the court. They'll try to figure out ways to make some of us recuse. Well, quite frankly, that is something that every court has to be concerned, has to be concerned about. And it goes on every day. This is, to, for me, the Supreme Court decides the most complex uh, questions facing our American life. And if they feel that it's difficult or it's an unduly burdensome to try to justify recusal decisions, we're in trouble. You know, it's just, this is, this is the kind of stuff that judges do. We consider recusal every time we pick up a case. That's the first thing you look at. Can I, can I address this problem? Um, and then finally he says, there are some security reasons why we wouldn't want people to know where we go or what we do or, or uh, 
be concerned. Sometimes for a, a very sensitive security reason, someone has to uh, recuse from a matter. And it's not clear at all what that meant. All right, so let's, let's take a look at some specific cases where justices have recused. It's, it, or I should say not recused. It doesn't happen very often. They don't really, they don't really share their reasoning. And when they do share their reasoning, it's usually because they reject recusal. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote on the denial of cert in, in Microsoft versus US, uh, and he said, look, um, my son is employed at Goodwin Proctor in Boston, and he represents Microsoft. And he represents them in cases for an hourly rate, and so it's possible that pecuniary interests of a child prohibition in the recusal statute, 28 U.S.C. 455, would affect my impartiality or my ability to be on this case. But really, it won't. And he says, my son's personal financial concerns won't be affected by the decision. Um, the fact that our disposition of the pending Microsoft litigation could potentially impact Microsoft's exposure in other cases doesn't matter. Um, I see that I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to kind of blow through this. And then he also says, but, you know, we have to remember that we need a full court. And he relies on that as well. Um, next is Justice Scalia in Cheney versus U.S. District Court. This is a case where just, uh, Vice President Cheney was sued for his energy task force, not following the Administrative Procedure Act and not following the Public Records and Public Hearing Act. And Scalia says, hey, the fact that I went on a hunting trip with Scalia and I traveled on Air Force Two doesn't have anything to do with this. And I'm not going to recuse myself for that. He says, this is an action brought against an official in his official capacity. He's not, he doesn't have a stake in the outcome. If he's not the vice president anymore, the new vice president gets substituted in. So I'm not going to impair the efficiency of this court, reduce the number of justices, and, and recuse myself from this case in a case involving official action. And, he, and then he goes on and he says, look, justices are friends of vice presidents and presidents. And he lists people who, uh, he, he lists, uh, you know, Harry Truman and, his, and Fred Vincent playing poker together. And he, he kind of goes through a bunch of episodes in history where justices and, and members of the executive branch have hung out together. Uh, Justice White, skiing in Colorado with Robert Kennedy when he was AG. The, and he says, look, that, that, that's just the, the reality of life. And then uh, finally, Justice Alito wrote in Moore versus United States. This is the 2023 case where he um, was said to, uh, where Senator Durbin said, hey, you should recuse. You had an interview with this guy. And uh, Alito says, no, he was acting as a journalist, not a lawyer. We never talked about the case. We often hear cases where lawyers have spoken, maybe even unfavorably about us. And then he says this at the end. He says, we are required to put favorable or unfavorable comments and any personal connections with an attorney out of our minds and judge the cases based solely on the law and the facts. And that's exactly what we do. Um, finally, Justice Kagan, in Holland versus Florida, it's a death penalty case, she recently recused, and her recusal was about a line, one line long. And she just basically said, cited the statute and the canon that talks about prior service as a government lawyer on a matter in controversy. It was literally a two sentence recusal, but you knew what was going on. When Scalia writes in Cheney, he said, hey, I recuse when I have to. I recused in Newdow versus US, the case involving the Pledge of Allegiance that you might remember. And when you look at New Doubt versus U.S., it just says Justice Scalia took no part in this decision. There's no reasoning. There's no basis to know why or how he recused. And really, what we're talking about here, I'm going to just blow through this stuff, because I think what we're talking about here really is um, all of the current uh, claims and all of the current issues really relate to the issue of rec recusal. They aren't in and of themselves the kind of thing that would lead to impeachment. But there, and there are many uh, efforts by the Congress to try to address these things in statute. 
There has been the Judiciary Act of, these are dormant, they, they are, they're gone. Um, I'm going to just, because I know we're short on time, I'm going to go to the, um, the current proposals. Um, there, there are, yeah. sorry. Um, okay, so the, the current proposal, S-359, is a bill by, by uh, Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island. And essentially, uh, the, it's called the Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act 2023. And it requires the Supreme Court to adopt its own court of conduct. And it says that the rules should be established by the counsel, counselor to the chief justice or agreed to by the court. There's a process for complaints. Um, it requires uh, the Supreme Court to establish its own gift or income requirements. It addresses disqualification of a judge, justice of the Supreme Court. And most significantly, it sets rules for amicus briefs, which I think is really a, a positive reform. All who participate in preparing the brief have to be identified. Those who provide funding for the brief had to be identified. Those who contribute more than $100,000 in the previous year to the entity filing the brief have to be identified. Um, and then there is, the next one is the Supreme Court Tenure Establishment and Retirement Modernization Act 2023. This is a, a, a bill uh, that was introduced in Congress by Adam Schiff, and then White House and Senator Padilla have introduced it on the Senate side. And essentially, it says in the first or third years of a presidential term, a president will appoint a justice. And the justices appointed will have 18 year, a single 18-year term. Justices who age out after the 18-year term will remain justices. They will be senior status justices, just like our senior status district judges. And they will remain in office and fill in as associate justices when the court has less than a full complement. The only method of appointment will be this way. Every two, a, a, a president in his first and third years of a term will appoint a justice. Um, and then finally, there is a proposal by uh, Jer Pre Professor Jeremy Fogel, Judge Jeremy Fogel at the Berkeley Judicial, Judicial Institute that would require a sixth canon of the federal rules that would apply to the Supreme Court with clear circumstances for recusal and motions panels of retired judges that would rule on those recusals. Okay, so things that won't change, we already touched this, right? President, this is President Nixon talking to the Supreme Court before he lost uh, in, his, um, in his bid um, in, in the Watergate case. But I'm gonna go, I know I'm getting the hook here, so. Uh, okay, so I think what reform should look like is this. Clear rules and processes. Let us know what rules you're applying to the Supreme Court, why you're applying them. Be clear about recusal decisions. Explain them. Let the public know what, what and why you're recused. Require disclosures associated with antithesis briefs. I think that's an outstanding idea. I think it ought to happen in all courts. And then finally, I think term limits are good for Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court justices. I think it would change the confirmation process. I think it would change the age at which justices can be, uh, would be nominated. I think we'd have a very different court. I don't think it's a good idea for legislators. I think legislators acquire expertise and become more concerned about uh, the state and, and you know, the broader implications as legislators, but for, for the U.S. Supreme Court, 18 years. I served 15 years, and I was ready to move on to something else. I think 18 years is a good time. So that's it. This is a quote from uh, Cardozo's Nature of the Judicial Process. I wish I, it, I, wish I had it in materials. Thank you. <laughs>